Let's say we have the square root of 2. My question to you is, how do we get the 2 out of the square root? How do we turn this from the square root of 2 to just plain old 2? Well, there's a really simple way to do that you might have heard of. It's called squaring. If we square this number, the square root cancels out, and of course, we get 2. But I want to show you today a much cuter way of undoing the square root, and it comes down to a sequence and its limit. The sequence looks like this. It starts off with the square root of 2. Then the next term in the sequence is the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. Perhaps you can see where this is going. The next term, it's even more nested square roots, it's the square root of 2 times, and then what we're going to put here is this previous term. So it's 2 times the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. And the sequence continues in this manner. And what this is going to approach, turns out, it's 2. Now if you want a maybe more formal way of describing this cute square root sequence that doesn't rely on just showing you the pattern, we could use a recursive definition. That means we'll define each term of the sequence based on the preceding term. This will require us to specify exactly what the first term is. So I'm going to say a1, which is the first term of our sequence. We know that's just the square root of 2, very infamous irrational number. And then I'll say, knowing what the first term is, from there we can get the rest of the terms. Because any term a n plus 1 is going to be based on the previous term, a n. Just like a2 is based on a1, a3 is based on a2, and so on. The way that you construct one term from the previous term is like this. You take a square root, and then in the square root you just put 2, and then you put the previous term, which would be a n in this case. Just like you saw here, how did we get the third term? We had the square root of 2, I'll get a different color here, and then we multiplied that 2 in the square root by the previous term. And you can look at the second term that way as well. What's the second term? Well, it's the square root of 2 times the previous term, which was root 2. Now, again, my claim is that this really cute sequence actually converges to, it gets arbitrarily close to the number 2. It's like a funny way of undoing the square root. Now, to show you that's the case, I'm actually going to jump the shark a little bit. There's kind of two things I need to justify to you to show that this sequence converges to 2. One. I need to show that the sequence actually converges. It could behave in some strange way, you know, maybe it oscillates like the sine function, or maybe it gets arbitrarily large, you know, who knows? Well, so I gotta show that it converges. Uh, but then separately, I would also show that it converges specifically to two. Now, we don't have to treat these as two separate things, uh, but in this case, I'm going to. So if this sequence does get arbitrarily close to something, to some number, that number is called the limit of the sequence. This is something you may be familiar with. So I could write the limit as n goes to infinity of a n, where a n is representing the terms of my sequence. Uh, if this limit exists, if the sequence actually does get arbitrarily close to something, then this limit exists and I could give it a name like L say that this sequence gets arbitrarily close to L. That means that the sequence does have a limit, and like I said, it's, it's a separate thing to prove that the limit happens to be 2. That's going to be the first thing I show you. So we're going to assume the sequence does have a limit, we're going to call it L, and what we'll prove is that if this sequence has a limit, if it does get arbitrarily close to some number, that number has got to be 2. After that, we'll prove that it actually does have a limit. And thus, in total, we will have proven that it converges to 2. So let's see how to prove that this sequence converges um, to 2 if we assume that it does have some limit. Once we give that limit a name, the rest is actually pretty easy. So I'll actually write this argument in orange, and I'll put it right here. The key, because the sequence is recursively defined, is to actually look at the limit of a n plus 1 as n goes to infinity. 
Now the limit of a n plus one as n goes to infinity, let me zoom in just a touch here. I know that this is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of, I can replace a n plus one with how it's defined. What is a n plus one? Well, it's the square root of two times that previous term a n. But we know as n goes to infinity, a n goes to l because we already assumed that the limit of an exists and we've called it L. So the sequence converges to L. So the limit of this thing as n goes to infinity, well, it would be the square root of two times L because again, as n goes to infinity, an must approach L. That's what we are assuming. However, what about this limit on the left? The limit of an plus one as n approaches infinity. Certainly that's also equal to L because a n plus one is the same exact sequence as a n. It just kind of skips over the first term because of the plus one, but certainly its limit would be the same. So this guy on the left is also L. So I could just plop down an L there, thus having that L equals the square root of two L. We can then solve this equation for L. Maybe we'll start doing that over here. Let's say we square both sides. So then we have L squared equals uh, squaring this guy on the right gives us two times L. And then what I'm gonna say here is that we know the limit L is not equal to zero. How do we know that? Well, because every single term of the sequence is the square root of two, or it's something slightly bigger. And if it's not evident that these terms are just getting bigger, we will prove that shortly. But regardless, every term of the sequence is at least the square root of two. They're not even remotely close to zero. They're definitely um, not getting arbitrarily close to zero. So the limit is not zero. So we can just divide both sides of this equation by L and on the left, that's just gonna give us L. On the right, that's just gonna give us two. So if the sequence does in fact have a limit, if this sequence of root twos uh, does converge to something, it must be that it converges to two. Now, how do we actually prove that it does converge to something? For that, we're going to use a really cool theorem called the monotone convergence theorem. Now, when we think about a sequence of numbers, there's a lot of different behaviors it could have, but some of the simple behaviors are that it could increase like this sequence, it could decrease like this sequence, or perhaps it neither increases or decreases. It could, you know, go up and down. And so its behavior just isn't quite that simple. If it increases or decreases, it's called a monotone. So the sequence only goes in a single direction. Now the monotone convergence theorem tells us that if a, well, there's a few different ways it could be stated, but I'll state it in a the, the minimal complexity that we need for, for this result. So what it says in that case then is if a sequence is bounded above and increasing, the sequence must be convergent. It must have a limit. It must get arbitrarily close to something. Uh, we could prove that of course, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to. Hopefully it feels correct. I'll say it again. If a sequence um, is bounded above and is increasing, it must be convergent because imagine this, you know, this horizontal line could be like an upper bound. Now, if the sequence has this as an upper bound, but also the sequence is increasing, well, then it has to converge. If we su suppose specifically that this is the least upper bound, so any number smaller than that wouldn't be an upper bound then necessarily the sequence as it increases is going to get arbitrarily close to this horizontal line representing that upper bound. It's kind of pressed up against it over time. It gets arbitrarily close to it. Of course, it must be convergent. So if we can prove that our sequence with the root twos all nested together is both increasing and bounded above, then we will have established that it must have a limit. And we already proved if it has a limit, the limit has got to be two. So let's start by proving that the sequence is bounded. And we'll say that it's bounded above by two. To prove that, that every term of our sequence, a n, is less than two, so the sequence is bounded above, it never gets bigger than two, 
we're going to use a method of proof called mathematical induction, which if you've never used or heard of this method of proof, it works a lot like dominoes. We have to prove that it's possible to knock over the first domino, and then we have to prove that if any domino gets knocked over, it will cause the next domino to fall as well. By proving this, we prove that in fact all the dominoes fall, as in all the infinite statements we're trying to prove are correct. The infinite number of statements we're trying to prove is that every term of our sequence is less than two. So again, to do that with this induction method, we're going to prove that the first term is less than two, and then we'll prove that if any term is less than two, the next term must also be less than two. In total, that proves that all the dominoes are knocked over. All terms of the sequence are in fact less than two. Now, the first term is the square root of two. So we have to prove first that this is less than two. And obviously it's less than two because two is less than four. So take square roots on both sides. You see that the square root of two is definitely less than two. So that establishes that the first term is definitely less than two. Now the next part, this is called the induction step of an induction proof, is to show that if some term is less than two, so let's say that a n is, well traditionally k is used, so I'll use that traditional notation. If a k is less than two, we have to show that the next term, a k plus one, is also less than two. That's actually pretty easy to do. We're allowed to assume this, we have this term that's less than two, we need to prove that it forces the next term to be less than two. In order to do that, we'll multiply both sides of this inequality by two. So we have that two a k is less than two times two, which is four. And then just take the square root of both sides. So on the left, we have the square root of two a k. And on the right, we have the square root of four, which is two. So on the left, we have the square root of two a k. Remember, that's exactly how um, terms of the sequence are defined based on previous terms. So the square root of 2ak is actually the next term of the sequence. This on the left is by definition the next term ak plus one. And so we have that if some term of the sequence is less than two, the next term must also be less than two. And we already proved that the first term is less than two. And so it follows that all terms of the sequence are less than two. And so we've proven that our beautiful root two sequence is bounded above. Now, all that remains to be proven is that the sequence is increasing. And again, we're going to do that using induction. So what we're really trying to prove now is that a n is less than a n plus one. This means the sequence is increasing. Each term is greater than the preceding term. Now, in an induction proof, we need to prove first this is true in the first possible case. That means we need to prove that a one is less than a two. Now, a1 is the square root of two. That's the first term of the sequence. And a2, the second term of the sequence, is the square root of two times the square root of two. Now, if we just write the result we want, the square root of two is less than this, we can work with this until we get something that's obviously true. Let's square both sides of this. That's going to give us that two is less than two root Two. And then if we divide both sides of this inequality by two, sorry for the messy work here. If we divide both sides of this inequality by two, we get that one is less than the square root of two. We know this is true, right? The square root of two is about 1.41. This is obviously true. And from here, we could get here and we could get there. So we could start from this thing we know is true. One is less than root two. You could double both sides to get that two is less than two root two. And then you could take the square root of both sides to get that root two is less than root two root two. And thus, a one is less than a two, just like we wanted to show. That means the desired result is true in the first possible case. Then, just like before, we need to show, I'll write this in purple, that if some term is greater than the preceding term, um, that's also true for the next pair of terms. So we're allowed to assume that a k is less than a k plus one. So we have this term that's greater than the preceding term. We have to show that this force is it also to be true for the next pair of terms, uh, which again is very straightforward. All we have to do is double both sides. So we have that two 
AK is less than 2AK plus 1. And then take the square root of both sides. So we have that the square root of 2 times AK is less than the square root of 2 times AK plus 1. But then, of course, these are both how we get the following terms. This is how AK plus 1 is defined, and this is how AK plus 2 is defined. So on the left, what we have is AK plus 1, and on the right, what we have, again, by definition, there it is, uh, we have AK plus 2. And so, indeed, we've shown if some term is less than the next term, then that next term is less than the one that comes after it. So indeed, the terms of the sequence just get bigger and bigger. Like I said earlier, we start at root two, every term from there gets bigger. So that was part of this um, statement here that L is certainly not zero. The sequence is definitely not getting arbitrarily close to zero because it starts at root two and just gets bigger from there. All right, so we have established that the sequence is increasing here. And of course we established previously um, that it's bounded above. And so by the monotone convergence theorem, we know that our sequence does indeed have a limit. And we already proved that if it has a limit, that limit has got to be two. So that's a cuter way to get rid of the square root, kind of fun. And of course, there's nothing special about two here. You could do the same thing with three, right? Take this sequence, the square root of three, square root of three times the square root of three, square root of three times the square root of three times the square root of three. Just keep on going with any number you like and you can knock out the square root. It is perhaps a bit ironic that a sequence constructed from so many square roots should get arbitrarily close to the number that you would have if you had just eliminated the square root to begin with. But hey, it's pretty neat. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.